Welcome to 15241 Today Talk, subtitle Jim and Lanny on stage. Our producer director is Glenn Ward, our coordinating producer is Linda Dedzitsky, and our associate producer today is Allison Hess. And we have a chance, Jim and I have an opportunity to talk to a great friend of ours. Uh, I've known Kent Tacovey, the former relief pitcher of the Pirates, one of the great relief pitchers in baseball history. Teak and I first met in 1974 when I was a broadcaster with the Charleston Charlies and Teak was was playing for the Charleston Charlies and our friendship has uh, been so strong that at one point uh, after the birth of our daughter Meg we asked Linda Tacovey to be Megan's uh, godmother and we're blessed that, that she she agreed. Uh, what do you remember from those days back in Charleston, West Virginia? Oh my gosh, Watt Powell Park. I mean, <laughs> it was, you know, you look at all these old films, Bull Durham and all the other films about baseball way back when and the things that went on, that was Watt Powell Park. You know, right next to the train track, the train runs behind the right field fence. Right field goes up a slope about 20 feet high. Um, you know, the surroundings of the whole thing. It, it was classic, old school minor league baseball. And I, unfortunately, they have all the really great fields nowadays. These kids don't get to experience that when they go through. What, what baseball was like in the 20s and 30s? Teak, uh, tell everyone about uh, the tryout at Forbes Field where you were fortunate enough. To, uh, tell that story. <laughs> Yeah, fortunate enough to end up signing the, uh, in a tryout camp that I got thrown out of. Yeah, it was a um, it was after the draft in 1969. I was not drafted. Uh, the 110 players were invited to Forbes Field for this tryout, and basically it's a normal tryout. In the morning, you run, you throw, you, you know, they time everything, and they do all the stuff. And then in the afternoon, they keep a group of players and they play a game during the course of the afternoon. Well, I was one of the 110 that was invited, went to the morning session when they read off all the numbers for the guys that were supposed to stay for the game. I wasn't one of them. So I was basically told, okay, thank you very much, go home. Uh, the scout who had sent me there, Dick Corey, was from Wheeling, and he hadn't gotten there yet. So I just sat in the stands and waited until he got there. Um, when he got there, he said, what happened? I said, well, didn't want me to stick around for the game. So he went down and asked the guy who was running the camp, says, I sent this guy here. Why is he not playing in the game? He says, well, I think the excuse that he gave him was that my time in the 40-yard dash wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Fred, I very sarcastically replied, you know, you don't run it to home plate. You throw it there. <laughs> but nonetheless, turns out he convinces them to give me another chance to throw. But not during the game because that game's already uh, filled up. There's a team called the Little Pirates. It's like an American Legion team that played at Forbes Field, sponsored by the Pirates. And they were playing a game after this tryout was over with. Well, they were, we were going to wait for them to show up, and I was going to throw again off the mound to one of the kids that was the catcher on the Little Pirates. Well, in the meantime, Harding Peterson, who was our general manager when we went in 1979, was the farm director. He goes up to his office at Forbes Field, and the old uh, recording machines, message machines with the tape in it, he finds out that in Geneva, New York, the night before, two pitchers had gone down. And it's right after the draft. They've just got people where they want them. They need pitchers for Geneva, New York. He comes back out, desperate to find pitching. I'm the only guy standing in the ballpark. I throw for about you know, 10 minutes to this American Legion catcher. And he goes, that's good enough. You know, now, you've got to understand, the Penn League is a second year, typically second year high school draft guys. I'm a college graduate. So I'm a little older, a little, been around a little bit more, so I guess I figured I could get through the year. Well, I got through the year, I did well enough, they couldn't release me, I got through the next year, they couldn't release me, and eventually the whole thing came together. But uh, yeah, I got kicked out of the tryout that I signed out of. <laughs> Remarkable story, Jim. <laughs> well, you brought, you brought up college, uh, having went to Wittenberg, uh, I knew a lot about Marietta baseball. Marietta baseball was pretty good. Yeah, Marietta Baseball, Don Shally had actually, I was in Don Shally's first recruiting class, first full recruiting class that he had at Marietta College. And uh, we always say that we were the foundation to them getting real good because we were 10 and 9, and uh, you know, that was as close as they had ever come to having a losing season. But it was just the very beginning of the program. Uh, he was just grabbing guys wherever he could, and fortunately, 
he wrote me a letter asking me to come to Marietta College and play baseball. Well, I heard from nobody else but where, Marietta College. Where was your College. hometown? I grew up just outside Cincinnati in Fairfield, Ohio. It's about okay. 20 miles north, and which is opposite side of the state from Marietta. So, uh, you know, I go to Marietta because there's the only place that uh, is going to give me a chance to play baseball. Go there, again, it's kind of the same thing. There's a whole bunch of guys there. I somehow or another filter my way through it, get in there, end up, uh, you know, making the team as a freshman and then, uh, you know, survive for four years and did some pretty decent stuff while I was there. I, I got a lot better when I was in college than I was when I was in high school. And, uh, you know, that kind of set the stage for the next part of my career, which was the professional part. What What about your delivery, your your unique uh, style of Kent to Colby. Um, when I was in high school and when I was in college, actually I, up until I was in double A ball, if you remember a teammate of mine with the Pirates, Bruce Keeson, who was right. built like me, tall and thin, threw right out from here from right out at the side. Well, that's the way I pitched my whole life. Got to double A ball um, and an old scout by the name of George Detour was in the organization. He came around, watched all the minor league clubs, and I was starting to get hit around a little bit. I had had a lot of success early, but I was starting to get hit around. And he said, you know, when your pitch is just around the edges of the strike zone, it moves real well, your sinker. But he said, when it legitimately gets in the strike zone, it doesn't move as well. And what was happening was, because the hitters were getting better, they were being more selective, they were getting more good pitches to hit and therefore they were hitting them harder, I was starting to have the bad results. He says, you gotta find some way to get that movement in the strike zone. Well, okay, let's go up here and throw like a normal human being. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I mean, we didn't use radar guns back then, but it would have been 82 mile an hour and perfectly straight, and there's a name for that, it's called batting practice. <laughs> so that, that didn't work at all. So the next thing, we're out playing catch in the outfield one day, and playing, you know, catch with one of my uh, cohorts in the bullpen. And there was a guy by the name of Ted Abernathy. He was a journeyman reliever when I was growing up in Cincinnati. And he threw from down here. And I'm thinking, oh, Abernathy, yeah, I remember him. You know, he played for, played for the Cubs. He played for the Pirate, or played for the Reds when in Cincinnati. And he also played for Atlanta. Let me see what Abernathy The first one I threw, number one, I threw it harder. Number two, the bottom just fell out of it. Bingo. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, <laughs> but I'm smart enough to know that this is, this is going to work. So, you know, I almost immediately had the fastball. Then I had to work for probably two and a half, three years to get a breaking ball to go along with it because it's a tough position to throw a breaking right. ball. But it actually, my style of pitching came from a 10-year-old, 10-year-old's memory of what a journeyman relief pitcher with his hometown team did 25 years ago. So that, that's, that was the foundation of it. Fortunately, I remembered, you know, like I said, I'm not the smartest guy. I don't remember everything, but fortunately, I remembered Ted Abernathy. I remembered how he threw, and uh, that's how it came about. That's very, that's interesting to me. Um, Do you have any quarterbacks ever come up to you and say, yeah, I want to throw this way? Uh, I, well, I, they might have asked, but they probably weren't very successful. No, they weren't. <laughs> I wasn't very receptive either. When you say you're not very smart, you're in good company here. <laughs> That's why we brought Lanny. <laughs> i got to ask you, uh, I ran into you one time at, our, uh, at my heart doctor. Uh -huh. uh, although I was there for a checkup, I think you were there for something a little more. <laughs> Serious, do you want to expound on your? Yeah, you know what, Jim? It's, you know, if you remember back to my playing days, tall, skinny, you know, I could eat anything I wanted to, I could drink as much as I wanted to, anything, it didn't matter, nothing, I had the metabolism, nothing affected me. And I developed a lot of bad habits about what I was eating and how, how much exercise, I wasn't real big on exercise to start with. I mean, you know, you know I pitched a couple innings, you have to run a whole lot. But all of a sudden, when I turned about 40, 41, 42, the metabolism changed. And then all this junk that I'd been throwing in there before wasn't getting thrown back out. By the time I was 52, uh, I had, had had a heart attack. And it was basically just 
the bad stuff that I put in clogged me up, and uh, they had to go in, you know, put the stand in, open it up again, and then uh, so from that point on, from age 52 on, I was kind of under the eye of the cardiologist, and uh, you know, now we know eventually, by the time I was about 65, then you know, the heart had pretty much quit completely because it was just being overworked, and uh, you know, we had to go to the heart transplant, which knock on wood, I was very fortunate to have, and uh, you know, if it's not for that, not only am I not here talking to you today, there's a whole lot of stuff that's happened in the last four and a half years that would have never happened that I've never experienced. So um, I'm a very fortunate man that number one, the heart attack didn't kill me, and number two, the doctors are so good and uh, we were able to get, you know, get me a transplant that has allowed me to continue on doing you sure what I love good. doing. Well, I don't know if I ever really looked good, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just trying to maintain. Again, you're in good company. <laughs> Lanny, you better get into his career. About the well, I, w I will, but you, you, the comment you just made, you, have, you and Linda have four children, right? right. Tell, tell us about your, your clan. The clan, well, the clan is half here and half out of town right now. Um, Chris, our oldest son, is living over in Bethel Park with his his wife and two granddaughters. Pitching coach for Bethel Park. He was the pitching coach for Bethel Park. They, uh, I see Tony Fisher retired. Yeah, they had a, Tony Fisher retired, and right. the, the whole staff has okay. kind of gone that way. Um, then uh, my second son, John, he's got the, he's got the the world where you want it because he's living at Lake Tahoe. One of the most beautiful spots on the face of the earth, and we can't wait to go out to visit him all the time. Now, I wish they would put a little more oxygen in the air out there, that would help. But John is living in Lake Tahoe. Uh, Beth, our daughter, our third child, is living in Peters Township with her th three children, soon to be four, four children. So, uh, you know, she's over there, and then um, Brian, my youngest son. He and his wife and their two sons live in Denver. So we've got some nice spots to vacation to, but we also got, now it will be six of the eight grandchildren once Beth has the next child. Six of the eight grandchildren are within 10 minutes of the house, and uh, Linda's pretty happy about that. She doesn't really need me for much when she's got her grandkids <laughs> right there. Well, this is the 40th anniversary of the 1979 World Series team. But before we talk about that, I hope everybody remembers that 1978, the Pirates played a game in Philadelphia in August, lost that game by about 10 to nothing, oh, fell 12 and a half ugly. games out of first place. Chuck Tanner told the media this might not be the end, it might only be the beginning. We all in the media said, yeah, sure, Chuck. And <laughs> then lo and behold, you guys take it down to the final weekend. Yeah, it was it was funny because you know at that time number one we were that far behind. I believe it was twelve and a half or thirteen games around the middle of August. That's a lot. That's a lot of ground to pick up. But number two, we were not playing well, so we were on the downslope. And you're right. Chuck made the statement. He said, "Just when you when, just when you think it might be over, it just might be beginning." And I personally was in the same boat you were in. There's Chuck being Chuck, you know, Chuck always optimistic. But uh, we went to the West Coast, and usually the West Coast is a killer because of the time change and everything else, and good ball clubs that were out there at that time. So, you, you know, we were in not the most favorable position, but for some reason, somehow, we got hot, and we started winning, and we started winning in all kinds of different ways. And uh, all of a sudden, by the time we get the first of November, yeah, you know, we're only eight games out. Well, we're, we're trending a little bit. And the Phillies, the team that we were behind, had now, once we had gone to the West Coast and came back, they had to go out. Well, they didn't fare as well as we, we did out on the West Coast. So all of a sudden, the gap was closing faster than you would normally think it would, would be closing, particularly when you're not playing the team that you're chasing. Well, all of a sudden, we get to the middle of September. It's getting a little closer, a little closer. And we finally ended up going into the final weekend of the series, or the season, four games in Pittsburgh against the Phillies. That's how our regular season ended up. We needed to win all four of those games to come within half a game of the Phillies. 
then if we won those four, we had to go to Cincinnati and play a makeup game because we had missed one game during the regular season due to rain. If we win that game, that puts us tied with the Phillies, so that game would be on Monday. On Tuesday after the season's over, we'd go to Philadelphia and play them to see who was the Eastern Division champion. Well, Friday night, we win both games of the doubleheader in unbelievable fashion. The first game, a uh, fly ball drops in between their two outfielders. We score the winning <laughs> run in the bottom of the ninth inning. In the second game, we um, end up scoring the winning run in the ninth inning on a balk. So, we, you know, these are strange ways to win games. Fast forward to the next day, Saturday morning, or Saturday afternoon, we're up four to nothing in the bottom of the first before we make an out. Willie Stargell's hit a grand slam home run. We're up four to nothing. We're going, wow, wait a second. We just won these two games last night. We're up four to nothing. Something really special is happening here. Unfortunately, Randy Lurch was pitching for the Phillies that day, and he ended up hitting two home runs. They beat us in that Saturday game that we started out with a four to nothing lead. And then we went back and we beat them on Sunday, but they beat us out by a game for the division. But that kind of set our sights for the year for 1979 because we said, okay, if we don't get 13 games behind by the middle of August and we stay close to the Phillies, we know we're good enough to play with them down the stretch. And that was kind of the the whole prelude to uh, to 1979 and our attitude going into that season. Yeah, and you and you use the word magic, and then you look at the '79 season. So many magical things oh. happen. Great additions: Bly Levin Milner joined the club in the off season. Foley joins the team as the shortstop at the end of, of uh, that of first month, April. Yeah. Madlock joins the team end of June. But, uh, okay, so so many magical things happened that year, including the Dave Roberts 19-inning game <laughs> where he, he somehow well, gets out could, of two major games. You could pick anybody on that team, and somewhere in that season, they had one of those yeah. magical moments. Yeah, the, the Milner home run off uh, Tug McGraw after Nikosha, and, yeah. and, and then Otter hits a grand slam the next weekend. All right, tell us about 1979. Uh, I think it was September 1st, Candlestick Park. Kent Tocqueville plays left field. Kent Tocqueville, and the only evidence of this entire activity that happened is there's a tape in my drawer at home <laughs> of you calling this play, this this situation, and I got to tell you, number one, your voice was a little different then. Yeah. Number two, you didn't have any idea what was going on, or neither did I. Situation is. Ninth inning, one run lead, Candlestick Park, two outs, nobody on, and Jack Clark, their big home run hitter, the number four hitters at the plate. Well, I'm pitching in the game. Jack Clark, because he's such a powerful hitter, you know, everybody's playing back. Medlock's playing like short left field at third base. Lays down a drag bunt, gets on first base, two outs. Daryl Evans is the next hitter coming up, a left-hander, and then uh, following him is Mike Ivey, a young catcher they had it was a right hand here. It was a big prospect and, and a, a really good player. It was the first game of a doubleheader. We'd already used a bunch of pitchers. Um, Chuck didn't want me. He wanted to bring Grant in to pitch to Darrell Evans. But if somehow Darrell Evans got on, he wanted to be able to bring me back into the game to pitch to Mike Ivey. So the idea is put me in the field, leave me out there. Uh, if Evans gets on, bring me back into pitch. Now, a couple of things are in play here. Number one, if they hit it to me in the outfield, we're not exactly sure how I'm going to get back to the infield because my throwing motion is not conducive to making longer throws than 60 <laughs> feet, 6 inches. <laughs> so that, that was a little bit up in the air. But we, we felt pretty comfortable because Darrell Evans, if you ever looked at his charts, his opposite field was center field. He was the biggest pull hitter you'd ever seen. I never hit the ball the other way. He always hit it center field to right field. Grant Jackson comes in a couple pitches later, about three pitches in, throws him a fastball away. He hits the nicest fly ball to left field that you've ever seen. Now, I, who have never played the outfield in uh, my professional career, I'm out there. I'm waving my arms. I got it. I got it. Like somebody else is going to. Omar Marino is 150 feet over this way. The stands are 100 feet over this. There's nobody there but me. And I got to catch this thing. So, fortunately, it was the first game of a doubleheader. Anybody who knows anything about uh, Candlestick Park in San Francisco knows that when it gets windy is after it gets dark. So, it's the first game of a doubleheader. It's still daylight. There's not a lot of wind. 
ends up catching the fly ball, last out of the game, and then there are a couple of consequences to that. Number one, for the only time in my entire baseball career, I'm standing on the mound when the game ended, which I did a lot of times, having no idea what I was supposed to do with the baseball. I've got the baseball, the game's over with, I don't know what to do with it. Until many, many uh, years later, I didn't know what happened with the baseball. Mm -hmm. I find out, find, eventually found out I actually threw it to Foley. I don't know why, he was the closest guy there. But, you know, it was that entire situation and the fact that Miller's upset because he's getting taken out of the game and <laughs> I'm going in to play left field. He's mumbling on the way out. I can't believe he's taking me out. He's putting Deke in. Well, I, I'm really glad that you did that because it's been one of my great banquet stories over the years. And I, my punchline is always, Jim, what are the odds that Kent Tocolvi should play left field for one batter? What are the odds that that one batter should hit the ball to Kent Tocolvi, and what are the odds that could Tocolvi should catch it? Right. So okay. Sorry. Right, so we got we got we're down to about four minutes now. Um, Seventy nine World Series. You guys fall down three games to one, and between the Saturday night game four and the Sunday night game five, Chuck Tanner's mother passes away. Yeah, we've uh, yeah we we've, we've got ourselves in, in a stew. That's for sure. And uh, you know to add to it, I don't find out until I'm driving into the ballpark on Sunday morning that Chuck's mother had passed away. We, we knew she had been in the hospital for a long time. She passed away that night. And, um, you know, it was almost like the fact that we were down three games to one was our second biggest concern. Our first biggest concern was Chuck and, you know, going through what he's going through. And it was funny because we're sitting in the clubhouse and nobody knew what to say to Chuck. And so we're just, it's the quietest the clubhouse has ever been. We're all just sitting there, and all of a sudden, Chuck walks out, stands in the middle of the room, and I will never forget this conversation. Stands in front of the team, walks out, and goes, you guys all know that my mother passed away last night. Um, she was a huge, huge Pirate fan. Listened to every game that we played every night. She said she knew we were in trouble, she went to go get us some help, turned around and walked back to his office. The entire room was still silent, but it was a different type of silence. Like, oh my God, I can't, number one, believe that he did that. You know, he just said what he said. And number two, we were all off the hook because we, we didn't have to say something to Chuck. Mm -hmm. But that was, uh, yeah, that was, a lot of people, you know, we, we turned it around because of, you know, winning one for Chuck's mom. But it, it wasn't so much that, it was just the idea that uh, we were in a position where we could win. And the timing of that event was um, particularly sad because of the fact that Chuck lost his mother, but also, you know, the, the catapult to what happened after that. Okay, so uh, games you win game five, you win game six, October 17th, 1979. You guys are in Baltimore. Game series is tied at three apiece, and here you are on the mound. Pirates are winning four to one in the bottom of the ninth inning. Tell us about what was going on in your mind, what was happening. You know, it's interesting because as a player, particularly a professional player, you always wonder about what's it going to be like if I'm there. You know, what am I going to be nervous? What's on, what am I going to feel like? All this other stuff. And it's, you anticipate all this stuff that could happen. When I pitched to Pat Kelly to get the last out of the 79 World Series, two outs and nobody on, there, it could have been June 22nd, August 3rd, it was no different than any other game. Hmm. It was totally different than what I expected it to be. I expected it to be the nerves, the, you know, the knees knocking, the whole nine yards. But it was a very calming situation. Then, when the ball comes down, lands in Omar's glove, it's like you have this moment where you're, you're, your brain just goes dead. And then the first thing that popped into my head was, oh my God, we just won the World Series. The first time I had thought about being, that being game seven, and if we win that game, we win the World Series. That was the first time that thought entered my mind. And it was after the fact was over with, 
not anything near what I expected that situation to be. One of the great relief pitchers of all time and one super guy, Kent Tocolvi. Teague, Jim and I appreciate you coming in to, great, to, great stuff. to join us. Teague. Thank you. Guys, I, I, you know what? When I, whenever I get a chance to talk to anybody about this, particularly you two because we've known each other so long, it's, it's just a thrill because I get to go back and live through it again. The emotions run through you again. So thanks for having me. It's been, uh, been a real pleasure to just go through this stuff all again. Kent Tocalvi on 15241 Today Talk. Let us know you're watching the program as we continue to provide you with uh, interesting interviews. Thanks for joining us.